DJ 2 PL. Uh, so real quick, sorry. Uh, some girl came to my office hours looking for you today. What? Yeah. One more. Oh, I just. She was. She was. She was. She was, she was trying to find where you were. That's, that's weird. I should right. find a better hiding place in the lab now. I think. Yeah. Uh, so real quick, actually, uh, the facilities people actually just came to me and they said that the governor is here. Uh, Shapiro, um, I voted for him because he's not a Trump supporter. Um, but the, the main entrance is blocked off. So when the class is over, you can't go through that entrance. You got to take the elevator and go upstairs. OK, all right, that's, that's why all, all the federalities and the cops are out there. All right. Um, all right. So uh, again, for the class, again, we had the, uh, the recitation on Monday. That's been posted on Piazza as a video. Um, Project one is still due on October 7th, or sorry, October 2nd. And then we will have, again, the special office hours on Saturday on the 1st. And then homework two has been bumped to be due on October 4th. And that's a Wednesday, not a Sunday. OK? Any questions about the homework or the projects? Yes? All right, so it's, it's, due, on the, it's due on the Sunday. And then the uh, office hours are on the Saturday. So whatever, whatever, that really, whatever those real dates are. Yes? The website and, and grade scope should be correct. I'm not. Other questions? All right, cool. Um, so then two sort of, sort of, or one sort of fun thing to bring up. Uh, someone said, hey, what about internships? Are these companies hiring? The answer is yes. Uh, and actually, somebody uh, posted out on, on Twitter uh, that you know, if you take my class, they're hiring. Uh, <laughs> And so Spacetime DP is a, uh, I think, I think it's a time, another time series database system. I think it's out of, out of Europe. Anyway, I don't know this dude. You can contact him if you want. Uh, but we'll post on Piazza uh, how we can, you know, how you can, you know, how you can get me your, your CV, and then we can send it to the, the various database companies that we know and that are friends with us. And again, if you haven't yet, please apply to Single Store. Right? Again, there's that special email address that's just for CMU students, uh, and that'll go directly to the hiring people and not the recruiters. Um, and so if you don't want to do an internship, uh, another way to make money through databases is that somebody actually posted on Upwork, uh, and this is real, that they're looking for someone to, to basically design database projects that are basically bus tub and, and class projects. Um, so if you like the stuff you're doing, you, you can get paid $100 by this guy uh, <laughs> to go, go re-implement that. Um, and the way we found this was somebody actually emailed Chi the TA, and be like, hey, I can do this job for you. And he's like, what are you talking about? Because right, they thought we posted this. This is not us. This is some rando. Uh, $100 is definitely not enough. Um, <laughs> like, again, like, you should be making $100 an hour in databases, if not more. OK? All right, so, what, so where are we at in the class? Right, we, we spent the last uh, week or so talking, again, about the storage layer and then putting the buffer pool on top of it to actually manage memory as we get pages in and out of, of disk. And so now we're, we're continuing up the stack and are now going to talk, talk about different parts of the system that can operate and execute and process those pages that we brought into our buffer pool that we, that we retrieved from disk. And so we're sort of in this middle layer here in the access methods. And now we're going to start talking about how do we construct the execution engine that's going to be responsible for uh, executing these queries. And so the access method is going to be the mechanisms for actually for access, accessing the data. And it can either be through an index or through, through, the, through the tables themselves and potentially other mechanisms. So to do that, we first need to talk about what kind of data structures we would have at these under, the, the, these sort of this, this part of the system. Um, and so this class will be on hash tables, which is an unordered, uh, unordered data structure. And then we'll spend uh, all of next week talking about tree data structures. Which will give you ordering data. Um, will, will give you ordering on keys, right? Again, so we're just sort of slowly building up, making our way to the top to actually produce results uh, for our queries. So, I mean, it goes with sort of that saying. I'm assuming everyone here is taking a data structure class or algorithms class. Data structures are going to be used all throughout the system, and we've already covered in some ways and some some parts of the system so far of where we're going to use these these things. Um, but there'll be other, other parts of it where we need to have you know, high performance, safe, and correct data structures to represent state of the system or the data of the system. So we've already seen how we can use this for internal metadata. Right? We talked about the page directory or the page table. Right? I, that's more or less a hash table being used to map 
page IDs to some location on disk or some location uh, in, in memory. We could use these data structures for the core storage of the tables themselves. Remember we talked about the, uh, the index organized tables where the, the actual tuples themselves would be in the leaf nodes of the B plus tree. So you could have your tables actually just be rep represented directly in, in, a, in a data structure rather than unordered uh, heap files. We could also use these data structures for query execution to ge generate ephemeral or temporary uh, collections of data that allow us to execute queries more efficiently. This is basically how we're going to Im implement hash joins very fast, or ha how to implement joins very quickly using hash joins. So we'll build a hash table on the fly, populate it with, the, with the, the data from the tables we're scanning, do the join, and then throw the hash table away. Right? So just because you know, we're building a hash table doesn't mean it's going to stick around for a long, a long time. And then probably the one you're most familiar with is using these data structures for table indexes. Like when you call create index, that's essentially going to create one of these data structures and uh, populate it with the keys and map them to the tuples. So you do faster lookups, like a glossary in, in a textbook. Right, so again, we'll see, uh, we'll see these data structures being used throughout the rest of the semester in, in different scenarios that are covered uh, in this list here. So now what do we care about when we design our data structures? Like what are the things we need to be cognizant of to make sure that we have an efficient database system that actually is also correct, which is very important, right? So the first thing we've got to worry about is how we're actually going to organize the, 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 the data structure itself in either in memory or pages that, that are, will be in memory but backed by, by disk in the buffer pool. And remember I said in the beginning, we want to make design choices in how we implement our system. Uh, if we know it's going to be backed by pages on disk, that we maximize the amount of sequential I.O. So maybe we'll lay out the, the pages in such a way, the data structure in such a way that we have long strides of data that we can read and write through multiple pages instead of doing uh, random I.O. And then we'll talk about how do we actually make our data structures thread safe. And so for this class, we won't really worry about it, but we'll spend a whole, uh, a whole lecture next week on Thursday, or Wednesday next week, talking about how do we make sure that the data structure is, is correct and sound if we have multiple worker threads or processes coming in and reading, writing, or modifying the data structure at, at, at the same time, right? And this last one's gonna be tricky because we're gonna care sort of two, two kinds of correctness in our data structures uh, if you wanna make them multi-threaded. There's the, obviously the physical correctness of making sure we don't have a pointer that goes nowhere or a page ID that's, that, that doesn't exist, right? If we have one, one thread accessing a page, another thread is updating it, and that the accessing thread reads something that the guy wrote, but it hasn't been, you know, it's, it's not, you know, safely committed yet, or it's not saved correctly. Then we may end up, you know, following a pointer to nowhere, and the system would crash. So we have, we have to avoid that. But then there's another kind of correctness that we'll get to after the the midterm, uh, at sort of the logical level, to make sure that if we make changes to our data structures, that our own thread can see those changes, or that that they, it looks correct to it. Meaning, like, if my thread deletes a key from an index. If I then go back in that same thread and read, try to read that key in that index, I shouldn't still see it. The bits may still physically be there, right? Because maybe we haven't run garbage collection, and maybe there's a little flag that says this thing's been deleted. So physically, it's still there, but logically, it's not. So we need to make sure that we don't see things we shouldn't be seeing, right? Again, so we won't focus too much on concurrency in th this week, uh, but we'll, we'll cover this in more detail next week. And certainly, this will be a big issue also, too, when we talk about concurrency control at the, again, at the logical level, having transactions and, and making sure we, we, we provide asset guarantees. But again, that, that'll be after the midterm. All right, so today's class, we're focusing on, on hash tables. And again, this, because it's a, it's a low-level building blocks that we, we can reuse throughout the, the rest of the system. And again, this shouldn't be news to anyone here. A hash table is just going to be an associated array that can map keys to values. You guys okay or you good? You're, What's that? I just said a fire. Oh, you had a lantern fly. Okay, sorry. I thought you said you started the fire. I was like, okay, that's even worse. <laughs> that was the second time. Second time? Yeah, today. Oh, today? Wow. Well, it, was, it was a fire alarm in Gates, yeah. Um, which I didn't cause. I caused one last year, not this year. Um, all right, so uh, with the last DJ. All right, so the way the hash table is going to work is that there's going to be, again, it's going to be this mapping from keys to values, and we're going to use a hash function that's going to allow us to essentially compute some offset within an array uh, and then 
it's basically reducing down the, the an arbitrary key to this integer domain that we could then jump to some, some location in our, our hash table to find the thing that we're looking for, right? And the, 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 this hash function has to be able to take any possible key, because again, think of any column type you can define in your database system, also any, any internal metadata we'd have in, in the system itself. We need to be able to take that, you know, a hash function needs to reduce that down to an integer. So in a hash table, the space complexity is going to be uh, roughly big N or uh, big O-N because we're going to have to store a, a slot for, for every possible key we, we want to have, right? The time complexity is nice because on average, we're going to get O-1 lookups, meaning we, we hash a key, jump to some location in this hash table array, and then ideally, there's the thing that we're that it's still there. Here, just kill it. There you go. So that's what, two, two kills per the semester? That's not bad. Um, all right, so again, on average, it's going to be one because it's going to be like, again, hash, ha take your key, hash to some location, and then you land a thing that's exactly what you're looking for. Worst case will, will be big O-N because, because we'll, we'll have to deal with collisions. It may be the case that we hash uh, our key, land in some location, and then the thing we're looking for is not there, and we've got to scan along on our hash table until we find the thing we're looking for. And it may be the case that all the slots in our hash table are full, and we have to wrap around. It's basically the, it's, it's one above the one where we land with the hash function, but we had to loop around to find it, right? And so the way you sort of handle this, and we'll see as we go along, is you, you size the hash table to be roughly 2n, the number of keys you expect. Now you may say, OK, Andy, how do you know, how do you know what n is? Well, this, this is what we'll get through that semester. Like the Davis system is going to try to make a decision or try to predict how many keys you're actually going to have. And, and size it accordingly. So O1 sounds great. And if you're, again, you take an algorithms class, this is the holy grail. You want this, right? You want O1 because, it's, again, it's constant time. But in actuality, again, in, in a real system, the, the, the constants actually matter a lot. So even though it's O1, you could have one hash function that maybe takes 10 milliseconds to compute. Another hash function takes 1 millisecond to compute. And obviously, the 1 millisecond ones meet a lot faster if you think in large scale uh, tables, like billions of keys. So again, just because the algorithm complexity is, is ideal, uh, on average is one, we have to still care about the implementation and make sure we're as efficient as possible. All right, so let's look at a, the, the sort of the, the sort of a toy example of what a hash table looks like, and we'll see all the problems that you can have with it, and then we'll build up this look at more sophisti sophisticated schemes that are actually used in, in real-world database systems. So the easiest hash table to build is a static hash table, where you just call malloc, generate a, a giant array, where you have uh, one slot in your, in your array for every, for every key I could possibly have. And then to find an entry for a given key, you just take the, you mod the key by the number of elements you have, and you land in some offset in the array, right? So here's my offsets, and then any key shows up, I, I know exactly where to go, go find it, right? And you don't store the keys in, the, in this array, it's essentially just a, a, a pointer to uh, some other location that's going to have the, the key and the value together. Right? And the reason why you need to store the original key is because uh, since the hash may, you could have collisions, which we'll get in a second, like you need to check whether the key you're looking, you, that you land on through your hash table is actually the, the key you're trying to find. And the value here could be a pointer to the tuple, like a, like a record ID, or it could actually be some, some additional values. For our, for our purpose today, we don't actually care. So what are some problems with, with this, this approach? Yes? What happens if we have so many keys as O and N? How do we add, how do we resize the table? So you said, what if you have, what do you have, uh, well, I'm assuming it's static. So what if you have N plus one keys? How do you resize this thing, right? And you have basically, in this scenario, you have to rehash everything. So that, that sucks. What's the other problems? Yes? Does it handle collisions? Does it handle collisions? What is collision? Uh, when the hash, uh, two keys are, get the same value. Yes, that's correct, yes. So you have two keys that have the same value. They're going to land in the same location in, the, in, in, in our array, even though they're not the same. But I'm assuming that, you know, that everyone has to be unique and you can't have collisions. And this, this example doesn't handle that. There's, there's one more problem. I'm assuming that the keys are unique, right? I can have key value equals 1 and, and key value equals 2. Like, same key but different values in my... In, in my my sort of toy example here doesn't handle this, right? 
So this is unrealistic, again, for, for these three assumptions. So the first one is like you have to know all the keys ahead of time. Uh, in some cases, you do. Other cases, you don't. In the case of the buffer pool, I think we talked about last class that if you assume that the, you, you know, the, the size of your buffer pool is fixed, you're going to have a fixed number of frames in your buffer pool. Therefore, you know the exact number of uh, slots or, or you need in your hash table. But if, I'm, uh, if I build a hash table index and I keep inserting tuples, now my, the number of keys is growing as I insert new tuples. Every key is unique uh, in this scenario here. Again, how do, you need a way to handle uh, keys that you know, you could have duplicate keys that would have different values. You've got to handle that. And then the, the thing that he brought up is that we're assuming here we have what is called a perfect hash function that guarantees no collisions, which does not exist in the real world. Uh, well, it exists in the real world, but it's basically toy implementations. No database system can actually do this. Because again, you need to know the key domain ahead of time. Right? There's no magical hash function that guarantees that for any given key, you can generate a, a unique, unique hash value. Right? The way to actually implement, implement one of those is through a hash table. So you basically need a hash table for your hash table to, to do this, which uh, for it, some systems do do that, but not for a perfect hash function. Okay? So we've got to be smarter, and we've got to make sure that we, we deal with the environment that, that we're operating in with databases. All right, so there's two decisions we have to make when we, have, we want to build a hash table. So if someone says they basically have a hash table, it's sort of two parts. There's the, the hash function itself that, again, how to map a, a large key space down to a, a finite smaller domain right, based on the number of slots I'm going to have in, in my array. And there will be this trade-off between how fast we want our hash function to be versus uh, the, how likely it is that two keys, two distinct keys will, will collide. All right, what's, the hashes what's the fastest hash function I could, I could build? What's that? It's an identity. You can go faster than that. So he basically says, for a given key, you spit out the same key. But if you have a string key and I got to make it an integer, how do I do that? It says take the first bit. Uh, yeah, that would that would be pretty fast too. Uh, obviously, you you just can return one, right? So, like that'll sit in the stack in, in a register. That'll be super fast. Now, it's it's the worst hash function in terms of collision because everything's going to map to one. But it, it'll be fast, right? So it's it's this trade-off trying to figure out, and you sort of think of the perfect hash function is the other other end. The collision rate is 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 zero, but it's super slow because you have to do this extra lookup, right? So you want something in the middle that's going to be fast and and have a low collision rate, right? And then the, and then the hashing scheme is going to be the mechanism we're going to use to handle uh, collisions after we've done our hashing, and the the way the, the trade-off here is going to be, again, sort of the classic storage versus compute in computer science. Like I could, I could allocate a two terabyte hash table, and I'm pretty, pretty unlikely going to have. Uh, I'm not likely going to have collisions if for my key set is, is super small. But I allocated this massive hash table, or I could have a, a smaller one, but I have a lot of collisions, and therefore I have to spend more compute to handle those collisions. So again, it's trying to figure out how to do the right, get the right trade-off between uh, not over allocating, but then also not waiting, wasting a lot of instructions to deal with with collisions. All right. So today's talk, we're, we'll talk a little bit about about hash functions. Um, just to sort of show you what the state of the art is. I'm not going to say how they work, just, just tell you that they exist. Again, we're database people. We're not in the business of writing hash functions. We'll let other people do that for us. Um, and then we'll talk about the sort of the, the, the classic static hashing schemes where you know the number of keys ahead of time. And then we'll talk about dynamic hashing schemes where you, the hash table can actually grow and shrink uh, based on the number of keys. Okay? All right. All right, so again, we're not in the business of writing hash functions. Other people that are smarter than us in the space have, have done it for us. Uh, so we're just going to rely on them. Again, the basic idea of a hash function is that we have some input key, any arbitrary number of bytes or of any type, and we need to re return a, an integer that represents that key. Typically, it's 64 bits. Um, there are 120-bit hash functions, but I, think, I don't think databases use those. There are 32-bit hash functions as well. Um, but anyway, so, so we're going to re return an integer. So, in this scheme, or in, the, in, this, in a database system, we don't care about uh, any sort of protection and privacy mechanisms uh, for a hash function, meaning we're not going to use anything that has cryptographic guarantees. So we're not using SHA-256 or whatever. Like, we, don't, we don't care about those things because we're running on the inside of the system. Uh, it's, it's, we're not worried about leaking anything while we can you know, build a hash table to do a join because no one on the outside of the system can see that data structure. So we, we don't care about any of those things. And, and as a result, we can actually run a lot faster. 
right? SHA-256 will be really slow versus something like, like you know, murmur hash or, or XX hash. Um, and as I already said before, we want something that's fast and it has a low collision rate. So this is just a quick, uh, quick overview of sort of what other hash, what hash function systems are using. Um, some systems like Postgres roll their own hash function, uh, but a lot of the more modern systems, they're going to use something off the shelf like XX hash or uh, murmur hash or the spooky hash. Um, so basically, the, the, the main takeaway from this is that the state of the art one is XX hash from Facebook, or it, it, with the third version, XX hash three. This one is shown to have the, uh, some of the, the fastest performance and also the, the lowest collision rate. Um, there are some systems that use CRC32 or 64 um, for hashing like integers, because there's actually CPU instructions in x86 to do that in, in, a, you know, in a few number of cycles. Um, so that's, you know, there's some systems that do that, but in, in terms of like random strings, you typically want to use this. So murmur hash is interesting, because it was murmur hash was written by this like random dude on the internet. He had a good, fast general purpose hash function. Google took that and made city hash uh, by, by forking it, and then they have a newer version called uh, farm hash um, that has even better collision rates. There's a, there's a bunch of different sort of hash functions out there, um, but XX hash three is what you want to use. And so there's a bunch of these repositories on GitHub where people have written basically torture chambers or benchmarks to, uh, to run all possible hash functions that are out there and see what the collision rate is, see what the performance is. Um, so this is this M hasher, SM hasher. There's another one written by, by the murmur hash guy. And there's another one that's, that, that's a fork of this uh, that's only for, it's not where, yeah, it removes all the cryptography stuff. But for this repository here, they have this like, nice summary here that says these are the ones that work the best and have good, uh, good collision rates. And then the, the, the top one here is XX hash three, the, the Facebook one. All right? So again, we don't care. It's a hash function, keys in, integer out. We'll just use whatever they have. Right? And then there's the, the full list of, these, of all the different hash functions. Some are tailored to ARM, some are tailored to x86 or whatever. Like you, you, can, uh, you can get you know, more low-level details based on the environment, but XX hash 3 is, is going to be a good default choice. OK? All right, so now, assuming, you know, assuming we're running XX hash 3, we want to talk about what the hash table is going to look like and how do we handle collisions. So for this lecture, I'm going to focus on the, probably the two most common ones. But number one is actually going to be the most common one of, of all the systems, linear probe hashing. Um, it's the simplest, uh, and, and it seems kind of brain dead in some ways. Uh, but because it's so simple, it is actually the fastest. Right? And then cuckoo hashing is a, is a variant of this that basically does multiple hash functions. So there's a bunch of other techniques, Robin Hood hashing, hopscotch hashing, Swiss tables. Uh, from Google. We won't cover that in this semester, but if you take the advanced class, we, we will cover those things. And I would say that the, the current research basically shows that the linear probing stuff and the Swiss tables are, are the fastest ones. All these sort of extra fan fancy versions um, are, uh, I said, they're try to be, they try to be more performance because they avoid having to, to spend longer time looking for, for keys by moving things around when you, when you insert. But all that work of moving things around is, is a performance penalty. And you're better off just kind of doing the, the, the naive thing in, in your hashing. Yes? Is there a reason the chaining isn't used? Or is that this question is, there's a reason why we're not talking about chain hashing, because that's dynamic. Uh, That'll be next. Yeah. Because right, chain hashing can grow. This is fixed size. That, we'll, we'll cover that later this semester, or later this class. Right, th these are all static hashing schemes. That, there's variations of linear probing. You can do quadratic, quadrat, quadratic probing. Uh, we, we can ignore that for now. Let's keep it simple. All right, so linear probe hashing is, uh, is, is, is really simple. It's a giant array of, of, of slots, and we're going to hash into it. Um, you know, if we want to do insert, we hash into it. If the slot is free, we insert the thing we're looking for. If the slot is not free, we just look at the next slot and, and and, and insert in there if we can. Or we keep looking until we have a free slot, potentially wrapping around uh, until we find a free location. And then if we you know, loop back around and realize we're, we're, we're at the slot where we started that, then we know the hash table is full, and we have to uh, abort it, and, and you know, abort it, double the size, and, and rehash everything. Right? It's a simple way to grow it. Right? So the state of implementation for this, or one of the state of implementations, is this Apicel thing from, uh, from Google. 
Um, and they have the, it's the flash ha hash, flat hash map uh, type or data structure. Um, and it, they have pretty good documentation to describe how, actually how it works. And some of the optimizations they do we'll, we'll cover. So this is sometimes called open addressing, open addressing hashing because the, the idea is that it's, there's no guarantee that for a given key, it's going to always be in the same address or same location in a slot. Depending on what, what, what got inserted before it, it may, it may get moved around, right? If you get a dictionary in Python, this is essentially what, what, what you're getting as well, All right? So let's see how it works. So say we want to insert key A, right? So we hash it, mod it by the number of slots that we have, and then we hit land on this location here. So we insert our, our key along with, along with the value together, right? Again, the reason why we need the key is because if we go do a lookup, uh, again, for looking for A, we need, you know, we'll hash to the same location, but now we got to do an equality check to see whether the key that we're looking for is the key in, in a given slot. Same thing. So if you want to hash B, same thing. Hash here, uh, mod by the number of slots. We end up here, and we sort at the top. So now we, now we want to start insert C. Uh, so when we hash C, it lands to the same location where A is, but but that slot is is occupied, so we can't insert it there. So we just follow down to the next slot and insert our key there, All right? Same thing with D. D wants to go where C is. We can't because that slot's occupied. So it just moves down to the next one and inserts it there, right? And we just keep going down for all the other keys we, we want to store, right? And in this case here, if, if say if F one the, in, this space was occupied, you know, F could have wrapped around, start, start at the beginning, and insert at the top, right? Think, think of it as like a giant circular buffer. Pretty simple, right? What are, what are some potential problems with this? Yes. He says deletion stock says you lose the whole chain. What do you mean? Like if you delete C and then you look up something that got like accidentally pushed down to like pass or after, then you need to like leave a grid somewhere C is so you don't like think that the thing is actually in the C spot and it's not there. Right. So he says, uh, I don't know if he's all the slides ahead of time. What happens oops, sorry. What happens if you delete C? All right. So delete C, we hash it, we land where A is, right? Now we do that qu the quality check to see, does, does A equal C? No. So we know that's not the key we're looking for. And then we keep going until we find an empty slot or the key we're looking for. So in this case here, after jumping down, we find C. And now we need to delete it. But now we have an empty space, as he said. So if I try to go do a lookup on something like D, D is going to hash to this empty spot. And it's going to say, oh, well, nothing's here. Right, but it really is the you know it's the next slot down. But because of the way the protocol works, the scheme works. If I see an empty slot, then I know I'm done. Right. So what's one way to handle this? Gravestone. You want to leave a space? Uh, gravestone, tombstone. That's one approach. Yes. Uh, we'll get we'll get to there. Which is, that that is the correct answer. Um, so you could do this. You could just like rehash it and move everyone up. Right. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Well, clearly it's a bad idea because I said no one does this. Right. But why is it a bad idea? It's to move everything. Again, think huge. Like I have a billion keys. I got to go rehash everyone. That would be terrible, right? So, that, so it's super expensive, and, and no one does this. Um, skipping through this, right? So yeah, you, you, this, this does not make sense. You don't want to do this. The, the correct solution is what he was saying is, was, is what is called a tombstone. And the idea here is that I delete C, uh, but instead, again, instead of setting it as empty, I'm going to put a little marker here uh, to say this slot, there was a key here, and now it's been deleted. So that way, if anybody comes along, like doing a lookup on D, it sees the tombstone and says, well, it's not empty. Something was here, uh, but there's nothing here that I'm looking for. So let me, let me then look down and, uh, and keep scanning along until I find the thing I'm looking for. All right? So essentially, you can reuse these, these uh, you can reuse the slot with the mark of the tombstone for new keys, but you just insert over top of it, and that doesn't break the flow or break, break anything else in, uh, in the hash table, right? Now, maybe in the case you want to periodically run garbage collection because you can start accumulating much of these tombstones, and it's just wasted space if you're not reusing them. Uh, but for our purposes, we, we, you know, we, we can ignore that. All right? So if I want to put, say, G, G can go right here, and, that, and that's fine. Now, I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to discuss this too much in details, but like there is a challenge though how you actually want to represent these tombstones. 
and also re represent something that's that, that it's empty, and potentially also represent that I have a null key, which you can do in, in a database system, right? So we could do the trick we, we talked about before with slotted pages, where we could have a bitmap in front of uh, at the top of every header of every page in our hash table. Like I'm not showing the division here between pages, but think of like for simplicity, every page is, is two of these slots. So in the header of that page, I could keep track of like, okay, here's the slots that are empty, here's the slots that are null, or here's the slots that are that are um, that are marked with the tombstone. All right. So I, I need some additional metadata to keep track of these things and. You obviously don't want to do it on a per key basis because uh, you know, that that could mess up with the alignment of things and, and, wa and waste space. All right. So the other thing we got to deal with now is is non unique keys. All right. So there's two approaches to do this. One is that instead of storing the value in our our giant hash array or or, or array uh, along with the keys. Instead, the value would just be a pointer, like a page, page ID, to some other location that will store my list of keys. Or sorry, yeah, list, list of values, right? So for, for the key X, Y, Z, there's a pointer to some, some basically a, a linked list that has all the possible values. And then for the other key, the, the same thing, right? What's nice about this is because as I insert new keys, uh, or insert duplicate keys over and over again, I'm not really changing the, the main hash table. I'm sort of pending to this, this sort of linked list. It's like the chain hash table that, that he talked about before, or he asked about before, which we'll get in a second. The more common approach is to just store redundant keys together, right? And again, this doesn't break the open addressing of, of the linear probe hashing scheme, is that I, I'm always hash, you know, hash on the key, I land on some location, and I find a, you know, I just find a free slot and I insert the thing I'm looking for. This does make it a little bit more tricky when you want to do lookups like give me all the give me all the keys of X Y Z, uh, the key value pairs, because now I got I know like I got to keep I got to keep scanning until I find an empty location, empty slot to know that I'm not going to see X Y Z ever again. Whereas in the first the first scenario, I find X Y Z in my hash table, then I then I land at the you know I follow the pointer to the the list of values, and I know that's all the possible values I could have for that given key. Right. But for simplicity reasons, instead of having to maintain the, you know, the sort of separate linked list for non-unique keys and, and the, the non, the, the, in, the inline version for, uh, uh, for, for unique keys, most systems just store the, use the redundant key approach. Because right? you, don't, you, don't you, you don't have to have multiple implementations. Yes? Your question is, how would you differentiate between like updating uh, the value of a specific throughput with uh, you know, inserting a new one? So his question is, how, how would you differentiate between an update of a, of a value versus a insert of a value? Um, yeah, for, for, for hash tables, you really, really don't do updates. It would be a delete followed by an insert, right? Um, and of course, now the tricky thing is, like, if I want to delete key X, Y, Z with value two, like, uh, I can't, look, sorry, if I, if I just say delete, if I only want to delete one of these, like, I have to know what the value is and to make sure I only remove that one. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm going to delete all X, Y, Z, which may not be what I want. Yes? At this point, like, if you have multiple, like, uh, sorry, a key with multiple values, shouldn't you just hash the entire, like, people? The question is, if you have, so if you have a key with multiple values, you just hash the entire tuple? What do you mean by that? Because like, at this point, like, you're, you're searching for a specific uh, key and value. So shouldn't you just consider both of them as the key and then like, have it as a set? Yeah, so, so like, yeah, so statement is like, if I'm looking for, if I'm looking for exact match, yeah. in that case, like, I don't need the hash table because if I, if I have, right, but it, like, if I'm trying to remove it from the data structure, like this exact like, key value pair, right, then you, you basically, how does this? You, you, you need to find that exact pair. You need to have it at the time. So, so, so it's just maintaining the data structure. I guess my question is like, what's the point of having a hash table if you're going to do this? If you're if you're going to have multiple values for for a key. The question is what? Why, why do this? Yeah. Uh, so like, if I'm doing a join, right? The 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 relationship between the two join tables is that one side might not be unique, right? Uh, so I, I need to have this. 
And so I want to get all of the, like you would have basically an iterator that says, give me all the values where key equals X, Y, Z, and the cart starts spitting those things out as, as, I'm, as I'm traversing the hash table, because I'm doing the join. Yes? Would you rehash when it's completely full or like 80% full? So this question is, would you rehash when it's completely full or 80% full? So the different systems have different, um, there's like a threshold to say, if I go above this, I know I'm going to overflow or run out of space. So let me go ahead and trigger a rehash. Well, I just meant that it seems like most of these problems get a lot worse as you approach 100%. Yeah, so to his point, yes. Like the, you get closer to that worst case scenario where like if it gets, it starts to get full. So rather than waiting till it's like 100% full, maybe go to 80% because it's better off to pay the penalty to resize the hash table, which is doubling. You, so you have to resize the hash table, double the size of it. Go through all your keys and rehash them and put them into the new hash table and then throw away the old one. That's not, that's expensive if it's, it's a large hash table. So, but there's a trade off of like, okay, well, if I'm at 80% full, I'd rather pay that penalty to, to double the size rather than all the additional operations that I need to do spend a long time searching through. It, there's no, there's no like one answer. Yeah. But that's, that's why there's a, there's a, there's usually a tunable threshold. Whether or not they expose, expose that to you, uh, as like a user of the database system, it depends on the implementation, but there, there'll usually be a threshold to say, when do you want to go ahead and resize? All right, so uh, some other optimizations we can do um, is that one is you could have different hash table implementations that have these different mechanisms or like, you know, decisions about when to split, how to store things and whatnot based on the, the data type you're storing. Um, so an obvious thing would be like, if I have, uh, I want to build hash tables that support string keys. If my strings are very small, like 64 bits or 64, yeah, bits or 64 bytes or 64 bits or bits or bytes less, then maybe I can store that in line in my hash table. But if it's a really large string, I don't want to store that in my hash table. Maybe I just want to have a pointer to the actual string itself. So now I could have a 64 bit pointer. Um, but now it's going to be expensive to do that lookup to see whether I have a match. So maybe I actually want to store the, the hash of that string as part of the key in my hash table. So avoid having to do that, that lookup, right? Um, we talked about storing the metadata, like is something a tombstone or something a, uh, a null value or, a, or an, an empty slot. You could store that in the page header because now you have a bunch of packed bits. You'd actually could store that in the entire hash table itself. Right? So the, the, the Google hash map does this, where they have a separate hash table just for the metadata that's much smaller and compact. You do a lookup in that to tell you what is the thing you're about to go look up in the, in the real hash table. Is that thing you know, null or, or, or empty or not? And then this one is interesting. This, is from, this one comes from ClickHouse. Uh, it's an OLAP system that, that came out of Yandex in Russia. Um, so they talk about how they want to be able to, since it's so expensive to allocate the memory for a hash table, you don't want to just you know, allocate a bunch of memory, use it once, and then throw it away. What you actually want to do is just reuse that, that memory over and over again. But you need a fast way to clear it out. So instead of going through and marking all the, the slots as deleted, you just maintain a, a version counter, a version ID. And whenever you say, I want to delete the, the contents of this table, you just increment that, that version counter on the table. And then now any lookup you do inside of a, a slot inside that table, if the version IDs don't match, then you, like if, you're, if, the, if the slot version number is less than the table version number, then you know it's been deleted and you can ignore everything in there. And that clears it out and then uh, and you increment the version ID. All right, so there's a bunch of different tricks you can do in different scenarios to, to make these things run more efficiently. And the various systems do different things. ClickHouse, in my opinion, uh, was, there's a, that link there will take you to the blog article. They claim they have 30 different implementations of hash tables. Um, a lot of it's templatized based in C++. Right, based on the data type, and they do, they do a bunch of compiler tricks to, to, to remove code you don't need uh, if you know like something cannot be null or uh, is a string of a certain size. Um, they probably, in my opinion, of all the open source systems I looked at, they're probably the most sophisticated one, that have the most sophisticated hash tables. Um, all right, so one variant of linear hash, linear prep hashing is, is a technique called cuckoo hashing. And the idea here is that Instead of having a single hash function to do a lookup to one location in my, in my hash table, what if I had multiple hash functions and I hash up multiple locations and I find whatever one has a, a free, free slot and I use that one? Instead of having to scan through now, 
uh, until I find a free slot for, for, my, for my key. So this is going to guarantee that all of my uh, lookups and deletions will be 01 because uh, you know, for, no matter how many hash functions I have, um, you know, I, I don't have to scan through. I'm going to land at some location in my, in my hash map or my, my hash table that has the data that, that I'm looking for or it doesn't exist. Inserts are going to be more expensive because we'll see in a second. You may have to start moving things around and reorganizing stuff. So there's only one system I know that does cuckoo hashing, at least that publicly talks about it, and it's this uh, OLAP accelerator from IBM uh, called, called Blue, B-L-U. Um, and in their paper, they talk about how they, they make heavy use of, of cuckoo hashing. And as far as I know, the best open source implementation of a cuckoo uh, hash table is actually from Dave Anderson uh, from, from CMU. Um, I think Google, you, he said, he, Dave claims Google uses a lot of it. And so the name has to do, the cuckoo has to do with like, uh, awesome. Oh, because it said Google, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, where was it? Yeah, the, so the name cuckoo has to do with this bird where they, they lay their eggs, they can lay their eggs in another bird's nest, right? And so the idea is again, my key may end up, may end up stealing somebody else's slot uh, in my hash table if I try to go there and they're, and they're using it. So let's see an example. So say we have, again, we have a, same, a single hash table, but now when it, anytime we do an operation, we're going to have two hash functions. So it's going to be the same hash function implementation that we talked about before, like XX hash, murmur hash, spooky hash, it doesn't matter. But we'll just give it a different seed uh, to the hash function that guarantees that for a given key, or it doesn't guarantee, but it's very likely that, that for a given key, it's going to, it's going to produce diff two different hash values. So I hash A, and I have these two locations here. So in the very beginning, my hash table is empty. So I can either flip a coin or pick the first one. It doesn't matter. And so I'll decide that for inserting A, uh, it goes in this, the first slot here. Now I want to put, put B in. Um, and so the first hash function hashes to where A is. The second hash function goes to an empty slot. So because the, the other one is occupied, I'm going to always choose the empty one, and I'll put B at the top like that. Now where things get tricky is that we have multiple, uh, our two hash functions or multiple hash functions hashed to two locations that both have, uh, that are both are being occupied. So in this case here, for whatever, you know, whatever protocol, whatever scheme you want to use, say we can flip a coin, we decide we want to evict B. So we'll go ahead and bash B on the head, take its location, put C in there. But now we got to, now we got to put B back in. So because B landed on this, using the second hash function, after, we, after we, we take it out and put it back in, we use, use the first hash function. But then that takes us to the location where A is located. So B is allowed to steal from A. So B goes there. A comes out. We hash A with the second hash function. And then we land to another location. And again, just like before in, in linear probe hashing, you need to keep track of if you're stuck in a, in a loop. right? So you just got to keep track of, is, this, is the key I'm putting in the same key I tried to first put in the very beginning, and I've, I've just looped back around, and I'm stuck in an infinite loop, and therefore I need to abort, double the size of the hash table, and rehash everything. So now when I want to do a lookup on B, right? I take B, hash it twice, and I, I get two different locations, and now I do my check to see is the key stored in this, in this slot, the key I'm looking for. If yes, then I have the thing I'm looking for. Again, now, and I don't need to do that linear probe scanning of, of looking for an empty slot or the key I'm looking for, because I'm guaranteed either the key is going to be there after hashing or, or, or does not exist in the table. Is this a good idea or a bad idea? He said it seems like there'll be more collisions. Um, well, no, right? Because if, well, so like there's trade-offs, right? So like, yes, could be more collisions, but like at least in linear probe hashing, you're guaranteed to always put something in there, right? It may be in the worst slot, maybe the, the you know, the, the, the slot right above the one you try to go into and you, and you loop back around. Uh, but at least if there's a free slot, you'll, you'll get it. Yes. This does random IO. I'm, yeah, he's, he's absolutely right. So this is doing random IOs because I'm jumping around. Well, the hash table is doing essentially random IOs, but once I land somewhere doing a random lookup, then it's sequential scan. This is always random, right? Yes. Uh, can't you like parallelize the uh, hash table? Oh. 
I mean, you're a good DJ. It's not, <laughs> and you do databases, so it makes sense, yeah. right? Databases are the key. Yeah. All right. Congrats. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> All right. So your question was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> databases. Yeah. Yeah, so his question is, uh, is it possible to paralyze the access to different locations? So yes, you could do that. Uh, like, there's two different ways to paralyze. We'll, we'll eventually get to there. Yeah, like, you could have multiple threads or single threads, but do uh, vectorized instructions, SIMD instructions. Like, uh, and for SIMD, this won't, uh, you could do this, but it, it requires you moving data around a bit much because you have to make sure things are aligned. Um, but so the, you may be able to do this in, with, with a single thread with vectorized instructions. Uh, I know there's techniques that exist. I don't know about cuckoo hashing, though. Um, but for, for to make this multi-threaded, it'd be so much work, or just too much work to tell two threads, OK, we're looking, looking at this key. You hash it this way. I'll hash it this way. And then to then uh, synchronize on who produces that result, that it's just not worth it. Yes? So your question is, um, do you have to guarantee that the uh, the hash functions always go to different? Uh, so like, for example, if A, B, and C all like hash, the output of the hashes go to only two values. Like yes. So that way, there's one key that cannot be inserted. So it's like, so, so do you have to guarantee your hash function can't do that? Uh, yeah, it can. You can't, right? That's why, again, that's why I'm saying, like, you want to choose a hash function that has a low collision rate. So, the, like, you can't guarantee that won't happen, but the likelihood that, that, that it will happen uh, is, is, is low. Okay, the only thing I can guarantee is a, is a perfect hash function. Does it default to the linear probing after that? This question, does it default to the linear probing after that? What do you mean? So, if there are, say, k plus 1 keys and k hash maps, yes. k hash functions, yes. then you only have k, k slots, right? So, you can put those keys, but you have k plus 1 keys. So where do you put the k plus 1 key? Oh, if I, if, I, if, I, if I run out of locations for this, either because all the slots are full or I get a wrap around when I try to do this, the cuckoo thing, I'm taking, right? You, have to, you double the size of it. Yes? Does this increase the cost of getting in like the general case where there's no collision because we have to check multiple slots to then compare the keys? Or is there like a defined order typically where like you check this one and then only if there was a collision would it be in this other one? Yeah, so his question is, is there a defined order such that, like, you can maybe just always check the first hash? Like, I'm showing two lines coming out of it, but in, in, a, in a, assuming it's not parallel, it, it is executing sequentially. Like, could I, uh, is there some protocol, say, check this, and then only fetch the page for the second one if I, if I know it does, it's not going to be there? I mean, you can do a bunch of different things. You could prefetch the second page, right? Because the hashing is actually cheap. It's the lookup is expensive, right? So... Maybe I, I, I could choose one that I have two page IDs I want India to look up on. So if I have a way to go peek in which one actually exists first, maybe I go check that one, prefetch the other one. Again, it, it, it depends on the implementation. Or maybe, maybe like I was saying, you could, you could like, um, you always try putting it in hash one first, and then only if that fails, then you put it in hash two, and then you're always able to look up hash one first. So you don't have to check hash two. But, it, but, but depending on what got inserted and how things got moved around, like, uh, you know, right from the other. Right. Yeah, the other. But it, the fact that we're coming up with so, different, so many. <laughs> Is there another woman? 
Is it is he's go, is he going to the bathroom or what's he doing? All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, so the, the fact we're coming up with different ways to do this, this shows you how complicated it is, whereas like linear propagation, you just kind of rip through it, right? All right, quick question. Uh, does so, somebody, like in the general production system, is that always like true? Or how many, uh, this question is, in a general system, what, what is the default? Actually, I don't know. Like, I don't, we can go look up on, on Dave's code and what the default is. It might be three. Okay. I have no idea. Yeah. All right. I want to get through the... The chain hashing, linear hashing, and extendable hashing, because you know we'll need this for one of the projects. Um, so again, all of these protocols I've showed so far, these are all static hashing schemes. Again, if we run out of space or we we, we loop back around, then we we need to you know double the size of the hash table and repopulate it, and that's expensive. So we will now talk about different techniques to incrementally resize the hash table without having to rebuild the entire thing. So the most common one's going to be chain hashing. And again, this is what most people think of when you think of a hash table sometimes. Um, and then, but then we'll look at two more advanced techniques uh, that, uh, that actually are used in, in real systems. So chain hashing, the basic idea is that instead of having this giant array of, of all the slots where we actually insert keys, our array is just going to be pointers to uh, essentially linked lists or, or, or chains or buckets where all the keys that map to that slot in our hash table will be found in that, in that linked list, right? If you allocate a hash map in Java, th this is essentially what you get. And so the, the, the linked list part can essentially grow infinitely because, again, if, in the worst case scenario, all my keys hash at the same slot. I'm, I'm just appending to this giant list, and I, I'm, I'm falling down or basically end up with a sequential scan. But again, I, ideally, if I have a hash function that's good, I, I won't, I'll have a good distribution of, of, uh, of keys. The way to think about this is that we're essentially partitioning our, our giant hash table we have before into uh, to, to smaller hash tables themselves or smaller tables. Um, we can get unique keys doing the same tricks we did before, right? We just keep appending the redundant keys to this giant list, right? We can still use tombstones, but oftentimes compaction is just is just faster in this case. All right, so now again we have here we have our bucket pointers, and this is where hash functions are going to hash into. And then these are just be pointers to uh, the different buckets that exist, right? So if we want to put a in, we hash it mod n by the number of bucket pointers we have, and then we land in that bucket. We find the first free slot, and we just insert it, All right? Same thing. We're gonna put b. B goes to the top here, just just as before. And then now in case of c, c mash it, hash it to the same bucket uh, where a is located. We just scan through sequentially till we find the uh, the first free slot. You had to take a call? Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, you put D in. Uh, D goes where, where A is. It's, it scans through. All the slots are empty. You can put something in the page header and say, I have no more free slots. Therefore, always expand me when you get to me. It doesn't matter. And then uh, basically, the, this page here will then point to another page where you can find D. And then we want to put E and follow through until we find, find E here. All right? And F, F can go here. So again, the nice thing about this is that I can grow the, 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 the key list within a bucket without affecting other parts of the, of the, of the table. But you can have a sort of like two level, two level hash tables where like this is a hash table that takes you into these buckets, another hash table. Um, but for simplicity, we're just showing it as, as a linked list like this. But doing that, yes, question. This question is, when you create a new bucket, how do you determine the size of it? Uh, so we're not talking about whether, for this lecture, we haven't talked about whether something's like backed by pages on, from, on disk or in memory. But like if it is a, uh, assume it's backed by pages that are on disk and our buffer pool. So if whatever the page size in the database, that'll be the page size of, of a bucket. So in, in Postgres, it's 8 kilobytes. MySQL, it's 16 kilobytes, right? Yeah, for, I mean, I'm showing within one page two, two keys because it's PowerPoint, right? So again, if I have uh, a lot of keys hashing the same location, this, this linear scan here can, can be expensive. So actually, a really simple optimization you can do is in your bucket pointer list, you also store a bloom filter that just tells you whether a key exists in, in my linked list. So if I want to do a lookup now in G, I first check the bloom filter. I ask it whether it exists or not. 
If, it, if yes, then, I, then I'll keep following the pointer and go then scan along until I find the thing I'm looking for. If not, if it says no, then I don't have to do that scan. So that avoids that having to do that, that extra traversal. Does everyone know what a bloom filter is? No. Okay. I, that's why I ask. Hold up. Bloom filters are awesome, and they'll be, they'll be useful for, for a bunch of things. All right, quickly. A bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure that can tell you, that can answer set membership queries. So a filter is different than an index. An index tells you, for a given key, where is it? It's in this record ID or it's in this page. A filter can only say, does the key exist, yes or no? Can't tell you where it is, it just tells you whether it exists. Right? So a, a Bloom filter, it, it's, the guy was named Bloom, it's from, I think from the 70s. Um, so the, the, the Bloom filter is, is a probabilistic data structure, meaning like it can tell you with 100% with correctness that a key does not exist. But if you say it, it can tell you that a key does exist, and it might actually be wrong, right? So it can give you false positives. And you can only do two operations on the basic Bloom filter. You can do an insert, and you, you can do a lookup. You can't do deletes. And we'll see why. So it's basically just think of like the most simple, it's just a bitmap, right? And a bit will be set based on uh, the keys that get inserted. So say I, I start inserting uh, members of the Wu-Tang Clan, right? So I insert RZA, and so I'll have the uh, uh, some hash functions. I'll, I'll hash it, again, same hash implementation, just a different seed. I get some hash value out, and then I mod it by the, the number of, of bits that I have in my, my balloon filter. And then whatever that number is, I set those bits to 1, right? Flip it from 0 to 1. I insert JISM, same thing, hash it, mod it by the number of bits, and set those bits to 1. Now if I want to do a lookup, like on RZA, same thing. I just do a uh, hash the key I'm looking for, mod by the number, and then I go check to see whether all the bits, uh, bit locations that I've, I've hashed to, if they're set to 1. If they're set to one, then I know, uh, you know that this was set. Or, or I know that. I, I, sorry, if it's set to one, then I, I, I think it could exist, but I could be wrong because something else might have set those bits. Right. So I'll get back true for this. If I do a lookup on Raekwon the chef, again, when I do a lookup, one of the bits is set to zero, so I know that cannot have been inserted because otherwise, those, one of those bits, would, all those bits would have been set. So I get false. But I, I look up ODB, rest in peace. Again, now I can get a false positive because I never inserted it, but it's, you know, his bits were set to 1. So therefore, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's true, but it's actually wrong. So you can put that balloon filter in front of the, 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 your, your bucket chain, and, that'll, and, and, and it'll be populated with the bits set for the keys that are actually inserted into it. And I can maintain it incrementally because every time I add a new, uh, insert a new key into my, that bucket list, I update my balloon filter. Right? There's different variations of bloom filters. You can have different levels of them. You have decaying ones. The, the size of the bloom filter can, can vary. There are hash functions. There's a whole bunch of different things. But like this data structure is super useful as we use all throughout the system. Yes? How does the rate of false positives change when you decide the bloom filter? His question is, how does the rate of false, rate of false positive change as you sign the bloom filter? There, there's a, some formula that says, like, for, if you want like a 1% false positive rate, you need to have a bloom filter this size and, and with this number of hash functions. Is it like exponential or like linear? His question is, is it exponential or linear? I don't know. I don't remember. But there's this website here, the Bloom Filter Calculator. You, you say what false positive rate you want, how many keys you have, and it'll tell you the size of the, the, the Bloom Filter you want, and then the, uh, and the, the number of hash functions. Yes? So the question is, how does Bloom Filter attain the deletion? They don't. Right? There are variations of them that, that with multi-levels, you can do it. But for basic ones, they don't. Again, bloom filters are super useful, and we'll, we'll use this uh, throughout the system in a bunch of different ways. We'll, we'll use it for hash joins. Because, again, it's a lot cheaper to go look up to see, is it in my bloom filter, than go look up, you know, actually follow a page and, and look on the disk to see whether something exists or not. Okay. So a more sophisticated scheme is called extendable hashing. And this is going to be like chain hashing, but uh, we're going to allow the... the we're going to be able to split the buckets to avoid these infinitely long uh, bucket lists. And we're going to split it in such a way that we only, uh, we only need to do it incrementally in a small part of the hash table rather than having to re rehash everything. 
And the key idea of this is going to work is that we're going to expand the number of bits we have to look at when we do lookups in our, in our bucket list, our bucket hash table, to go find the, the bucket chain that, that we're looking for. And we can vary this per um, uh, sort of per, per value, per key type, not key type. We can, we can vary this based on uh, what bucket list we're looking at. So it may be the case that two different locations, multiple locations in our, in our bucket array will point to the same bucket list, but then that can expand and break up as, as we need it as we go along. Um, so I, I didn't actually think this is, this is a bit complicated, and I didn't think actually any system actually uses it. Um, but it turns out GDBM, which is a GNU database manager, think of like you know, uh, a key value store, that you, like, sort of like RocksDB or SQLite, you can run this in, embedded in your system. They, that's based entirely on extendable hash tables. And then AsterixDB is a, was a big data project out of UC Irvine, um, and, they have a, and they're, they're using extendable hashing in their implementation. Right? So let's see how this works. All right, so the first thing we're going to have is that we have our, again, our slot array, and it's going to point to our bucket list. And then we're going to have this, this global identifier that tells us how many bits we need to look at for our hash values to determine how we do our lookups in our, in our bucket array. And then for sort of bookkeeping reasons, every bucket list as well will also have what, what their local bit, uh, bit size is, the number of bits they need to look at. So you can see in the case here, uh, these first two slots here, they're both going to be pointing to the same bucket list. Whereas these two ones at the bottom, they're going to be pointing to different locations, right? And this is because the the we need to look at globally. We're looking to look at two bits, but for the the first two entries, when the when the, the most significant bit is zero, they're going to reuse the same the same bucket list identified by the the local identifier up here, right? So let's say now I want to do a lookup on on this key here. I hash it. I then look at the, the top two bits, because that's what's set in my, my, my global identifier, global counter. Um, and then I hash in this location. I just follow the pointer, and I land in that bucket. And I can just do the linear search to find the thing I'm looking for. Say now I want to put B. B, uh, again, I, globally, I know I need to look at two, the top two bits. I do a lookup in my, 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 hash, my, bucket, my bucket list uh, based on those two bits. Then I land to this location here, and I go ahead and, and insert it. But now I want to put C in. And if I look at the, the last two bits, it lands in the same location when I inserted B. But now this bucket is full. I can't put any more entries in. So I need to expand the number of bits I'm looking at to now expand the, the, the number of options that I have. So I'm going to increment the global counter to, from 2 to 3. I'm going to double the size of the number of uh, pointers I have in my, my bucket array. But then the, and, and create the new entry. But then in the, the, when the bit is set to zero, they're all still going to point to the first bucket here because I haven't spent that one yet. So I only I need to look at one bit for that. For the the next, when, it's, when the bits are one one, that points to this other bucket down here, and the same thing for these, these other ones, right? So now when I want to do a lookup to put C in, I need to look at three bits. I, I follow the pointer here that then takes me to this bucket location. Right, so going back here, when I did my split, I had to resize. These guys just slid down, and I only had to insert uh, one new bucket. Uh, but I took what was here, because this one was full, and I just split that one and created a new bucket for it. I didn't have to touch the one at the bottom, and I didn't have to touch the one at the top. I do have to double the size of this, but like that's, uh, you have to take a latch on it when you do it, because you have to make a, you know, make a copy and, and, and resize it. But it's not. It's not that big of a deal. You can do that pretty quickly. Any questions about this? Yes? Is this good? Is this good? <laughs> um, so resizing this lot array is relatively cheap. The, well, sort of like it's clever. It's a good idea. Uh, sorry. It's a clever idea, whether or not it's good or not. Um, it, Engineering-wise, it's a bit tricky to keep track of all the metadata, where like, you know, what, you know, what bits I need to be looking at as I hash into it. Um, but it's basically just chain hashing. So all the benefits I get from chain hashing are, are applicable here. It's just I have an extra mechanism now to split things up, so I don't have this infinitely growing, uh, you know, uh, linked list. So it's just a way to to, to handle re incremental resizing. 
in a way you couldn't do in uh, in regular chain hashing. Yes. So why don't people use it? Because it starts to compromise. I think. Yeah. Again, linear probing is probably the easiest thing to do, and the lock the whole table and double the size of it is sometimes is good enough. All right. So the last one is linear hashing. Um, and this is actually what Postgres does, um, or it's something very close to this. And the reason why Postgres, uh, well, there's another system called BerkeleyDB that also does this. Um, the, the, the company that built BerkeleyDB was a company called Sleepy Cat Software. So the people that build Wire Tiger, they, 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 they originally started Sleepy Cat. That got sold to Oracle. So Berk Oracle owns BerkeleyDB. And then they went out and started a new company. Instead of calling it Sleepy Cat, they called it a Wire Tiger, like a, like a, like, you know, a tiger and cocaine or whatever. Um, it was trying to be the opposite. But, but the, the woman that wrote the linear hashing implementation in Postgres in the early 90s was the founder of BerkeleyDB. So she wrote it for Postgres and then wrote it for BerkeleyDB. Right? Um, and she was uh, one, one of Stonebreaker's PhD students at, at a Berkeley. So the way linear, ha linear hashing is going to be more complicated than like, symbol hashing potentially, but um, the basic idea is that we're going to keep track of uh, the next, next bucket list we want to split, um, and that when any time there's an overflow in, our, in, our, in our, our bucket list chain and anywhere in our hash table, whatever we're pointing at with our split pointer, that's the one we're, we're going to split. And the idea here is that, again, we want to do this incrementally and not have to lock the whole table while we resize, so we can make small changes as, as we go along. And the idea here is, again, you're amortizing the cost of resizing, so it, like, it's sort of shared across multiple workers. So there's, there's not like one worker who's the unlucky one that shows up, tries to insert something, and then you know, they draw the short straw, and they're responsible for resizing the whole thing. You do it in, in, in incrementally as you go along, and that sort of smooths out performance. So again, the idea here is that we're going to, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to split a, uh, split whatever the next one we need to split, which may not be the one that overflowed. It should be whatever the next one is in, in our incremental order. And then we'll have maintain multiple hash functions that, that, that are going to help us determine uh, which location within our, our, our bucket list we should be looking at. Let me show the diagram, and this will make more sense. So again, just like before, we, we have, we have our, our bucket list here, and that's going to map to uh, you know, bucket chains. And then we're going to have a split pointer that's going to say, here's the next thing we want to split anytime any, anything overflows in our hash, hash table. And then we have, at the very beginning, we assume we have one hash function that's just the key, say it's the, you know, it's the, the identity, the key mod by, the, the, by n, for simplicity reasons. But again, assuming like, it's taking any arbitrary string or any arbitrary byte sequence and spitting out uh, an integer. All right, so say I want to put, uh, I want to get six. Uh, I do my lookup. Uh, I, and, and at two, and I follow along, and I find the key I'm looking for. Like that, that looks just like before, nothing, nothing special. But now I want to put 17, and it should go into this bucket here, but that thing's full. So we're just going to do an overflow, just, just like chain hashing. We're going to extend it with, with another, another, another bucket and insert it into, the, uh, in, insert it into that, that new page. But now, because we overflowed, we need to split whatever the, the split pointer was pointing at. So in this case here, it's pointing to, uh, to bucket zero, or bucket list zero, even though that didn't overflow. So what we need to do now is look at all the entries inside this bucket list, and we're going to rehash them based on the, uh, based now on 2n, because we're going to incrementally grow the size of the, the bucket list by one each time. Right? So we had, we had four entries. Now, after we got a split, now we'll have five. So we go through, and and you know, this point's there. For every single key, we're going to rehash it based on, on instead of mod n, but mod 2n. So 8, mod 8 is 0, so that stays where it was. 20 mod 8 is now 4, so that's going to get moved down to this, this new page down here. Right? And then now the split pointer just moves down by 1, uh, and we continue doing whatever, you know, uh, continue op operating on the hash table. Right? So now I do a get 20. I first, uh, when, when I first hash it, I would get zero, but then I know that the, that location in my, in my bu bucket list here is above where the split pointer is currently printing at, so I know I've already splitted everything up above it. So after I mod it by four, 
I got to mod it by eight now to figure out where it really is. And then that's how I can find it down here at the bottom. Say I want to get nine. In this case here, it's pointing to exactly where the, the bucket, uh, the split pointer is pointing at. So I know I haven't split it yet. So I, I can just only hash it once and I scan along the, the link list until I find the thing I'm looking for. All right? And at some point, the split pointer will get to the bottom and I'll have, I'll have eight slots and I, I just loop back around and start all over again. So this seems kind of, again, counterintuitive that like I'm not splitting the thing that overflowed, I'm splitting to whatever the split pointer points at. But the idea is again that like if, you know, say this, this location or this, you know, slot one, this thing is super hot and I keep overflowing and overflowing, uh, well, I'm, I'm eventually going to split it, right? So eventually everything, everything will get split out and sort of res you'll resize correctly. Yes? One thing I'm confused about is it seems like every time we overflow by one, the split pointer moves down by one and then we add one new page. So when would the split pointer ever wrap around? Because it moves down by one the same time we add a new page. Uh, so this question, yeah, so this question is when, when would it actually wrap around because you each add by one? So you would get to the point where like, so it'd be what five, six, seven, and then you'd be seven, and then you'd have to um, you you loop back around to zero because you know that like in the, from from when it's here, when it's only from zero to three. You, yeah, when, once you get past seven, you know where you start at the starting point that that's two n from where you started at. So then you loop back around. But don't we add a new page every time we? Yeah, you add a new page, but like I know that I should wrap around when I get uh, when I go to eight at, at position eight because I when I started I had four, so two times four is eight. So when I get past eight, I loop back around. Okay. Then then you do that until you get sixteen and loop back around. Good idea or bad idea? It's clever, right? Again, it's, it's a nice technique to again, do, do this incrementally. Uh, but again, there's a lot more bookkeeping, a lot more machinery in order to actually implement this. Yes? So when you do a lookup, you only do hash on those twice. And in, in this, his question is, if you only do, when you do a lookup, you only ha hash it most twice? In this scenario, yes. Not in this scenario? Like, if, like if, if this thing is massive, I could have like, right? Yeah, so actually what happens is once I get to Say I got to eight and I wrap back around, I can drop the first hash function. Right. Yeah, so in this case here, you would add most two. Yes. Yes. Can you go to the next slide? Um, About deletes? Um, yes, it's like, so there are only five pages, but you are, more, uh, you are calculating the hash value by modding two and which is eight. So what if you get seven? Yeah, his question is, and here, like, I'm trying to mod by, by 8, but what if I get into 7 and I don't have it? But again, you, you wouldn't be able to get 7 because uh, you'd, you'd be below the split pointer and you'd only hash by, by 4, not 8. Right? So, so, th so this demarcation line that says I've split everything above and nothing below avoids that problem. That, like, you don't land here and you really, like, you don't, you don't hash first and land here, but if you hash by 2n, you land something here that you haven't split yet. The split pointer waterline avoids that problem. All right, so um, splitting buckets based on the split pointer eventually gets you all overflow buckets. Um, again, when, I've already said this. When you reach the bottom, you just drop the first hash function and loop back around. Um, the... And this technique also allows you to do uh, contraction or coalescing as well, because you could identify that uh, a bucket list is empty, and you could do the reverse. You could 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 throw it away, consolidate the the well, one bucket's empty, so like you can just throw it away, and you move the split pointer back up, and that allows you to actually shrink the size of the hash table. All right. So going back here, say I delete twenty, uh, I mod it by four. But then I realize that's below the split pointer, and I got to get down to the bottom here. And I go ahead and delete it. But now this page is empty. So if I wanted to, I could just move the split pointer back up 
and then drop that last entry and drop the last hash table, right? And obviously you need, you need to be clever and make sure that like, I don't oscillate like insert 20, delete 20, insert 20, and like I keep splitting it and coalescing, that would be bad. Uh, but you could contract the, the data structure based on this, right? You don't want to do insert 21, then overflow, and then sp split all over again, right? I don't think Postgres supports uh, shrinking the size of the hash table, as far as I know, without this rebuilding the whole thing. OK? All right, so hash tables. Again, super useful. Most systems are going to just implement the linear probe hashing. But again, you can still specialize it based on the data type and other aspects of how it's going to be used. And ClickHouse is probably the best example of this. Um, for a lot of the commercial systems, it's very hard to know what, they're, what hash table they're actually using, uh, unless there's a paper talking about it, or we know people that work there that can tell us. Uh, you know, this is not something you, as like, you know, someone using SQL, an application developer, you should know or care. Um, but it's nice to know what, what sometimes what, how these systems are implemented. Um, cause the nice thing about hash functions, again, it'll be fast. They'll support O1 lookups in the best case scenario. But again, we need to be able to make sure that we can, um, you know, we, 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 we may need to grow efficiently if, if, if we estimate the size incorrectly. And we'll see how we do those estimations later on. So some systems will give you hash tables when you call create index. Postgres will let you do this. Postgres, if you call create index, you can say using hash, and you'll get a hash table. You'll get their, uh, their, their linear hash table implementation, right? But this is not the default for, for almost all systems when you, when you call create index. Does anybody know why? No range scans. Exactly, yes. The only thing you can do with the hash table is the quality lookups, and you need to have the entire key, right? If my key is on... Uh, you know, column A and column B, I can do composite keys. If I don't have A or I don't have B, I can't do a lookup. In a B plus tree, which we'll discuss next class, uh, you can do these prefix lookups. And it is the best data structure of all time uh, for databases. Um, tries are actually pretty good too, um, but you can put tries in your B plus trees. Um, you can do a bunch of things like that. Um, so anyway, so, so the, the default choice for most of these systems are going to be a B plus tree. And that's what we'll discuss uh, next week. But again, we'll assume it's single-threaded uh, on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we'll see how to make it multi-threaded. OK? All right, hit it. This shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. Listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. <laughs> I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see your wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs>